nobody wants to talk about anything. So, anything. right, exactly. And and this is even like between friends, like women are not open and honest about what's really going on, what they're experiencing, the drugs that they're on, the things that they're trying. Um, and I just find, I have found that this lack of, you know, women really talking about it to each other and, and not having any conversations at all is why we're seeing so many women that end up with hormonal problems, women that end up on the other side of PED use, looking in the mirror saying, oh my God, what the fuck did I do to myself? Be sure to download your free guide, Five Things Every Bodybuilder and Fitness Competitor Needs to Know Before Your Next Show at eeandbb.com. That's www.eeinbb.com. Well, welcome back to the Everything Else in Bodybuilding podcast. My goal of this show is to talk about topics that in bodybuilding that are uncomfortable, that are biased, they get swept under the rug. And I want to educate on more than just nutrition and training. So this episode is actually part two of a two-part sequence I'm doing called The Dark Side of Bodybuilding. Last week, well, last episode, I talked about coaches and, and trainers and photographers that are perverts. And I shared some of my own stories which was very uncomfortable for me. And I'm so excited to have a guest on today to talk about part two of this series of, oh man, just a topic that I think is super taboo. I'm excited to talk to you about all of this stuff. And I think it really, it gives a lot of judgment, curiosity, it, it inspires misinformation. So today, what we're going to talk about is PEDs. And if you don't know what PEDs are, they are performance enhancing drugs not creatine, right? <laughs> so not whey protein. We're talking about performance enhancing drugs and we're going to go uh, a deep dive and we're going to talk about the basics, the risks, the advantages, the repercussions. You know, there's one side of the story that it, of the industry that is enhanced. You hear a lot about um, people in from bikini all the way up to bodybuilding. And then there's the other spectrum, which is quote unquote natural bodybuilding, where they're not enhanced. And they're actually doing surprise drug tests in uh, airport bathrooms just to prove that you're not on any performance enhancing drugs. So I started 20 years ago in bodybuilding um, and I never went the route of PEDs. I was a natural bodybuilder. Um, so I don't have firsthand experience with PEDs. So I, I wanted to bring on somebody who knows what they're talking about. And I'm going to just put the disclaimer out there right now that this podcast is meant for informational purposes only, is not meant to be a substitute for medical advice or used to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease, and always consult your doctor before starting or stopping any supplements or medications. So having said all of that, I'm going to take a moment to introduce my very special guest today, I just think you are a superpower. Her name is Jamie Pinder. <laughs> She's been in the industry for 10 years. I'm so excited to see you on the Olympia stage three times in my favorite category, personally, is the physique category. And uh, oh my goodness, if you haven't seen her pictures, go to her Instagram and just totally Instagram stalk her. She's incredible. <laughs> so <Thank> Jamie, you. <laughs> you caught my attention because you're bold, you're honest, you're straightforward. You, you talk about the things that people aren't talking about. And I wanted you on here because I thought you'd actually answer questions, that you're not going to uh, be evasive or sugarcoat things. You're actually going to tell it how it is. And you're a total freaking savage. I mean, <laughs> well, oh my thank God. You. <laughs> the story that I heard of you uh, training at the gym Mm -hmm. You tear something. I don't know it was a muscle or a ligament or something, like totally crazy. You oh, go and tear yeah. something. Yeah. You, you, you even said it point blank that you went out in, the, out in the back, smoked a bowl, came back in and just got your training done. I was just like, all right, who is this person? <laughs> yeah. I mean, granted, that's not a smart thing to do. So <laughs> it was savage, but at the same time, it was very dumb. So, you know, one, <laughs> one thing I have to say is like the reason I'm so open about talking about women in PEDs is because of my own journey and the things that I have gone through competing. And I know for myself, like it was very hard as I was competing to find really good, useful information about women in PEDs. It just really wasn't out there. And 
you know, even having girlfriends that competed and people that like, you know, women, other women in my life that were in this sport and everyone's closed lipped. Nobody wants to talk about anything. So, anything. right, exactly. And, and this is even like between friends, like women are not open and honest about what's really going on, what they're experiencing, the drugs that they're on, the things that they're trying. Um, and I just find, I have found that this lack of, you know, women really talking about it to each other and, and not having any conversations at all is why we're seeing so many women that end up with hormonal problems, women that end up on the other side of PED use, looking in the mirror saying, oh my God, what the fuck did I do to myself? And I started to notice that in the sport, especially when it came to women at the high level, especially when we're looking at the divisions that are a little bit more aggressive, like the female bodybuilding, women's physique, figure, you see these women who are competing for, and they were like competing at a high level for years. And then all of a sudden they would just disappear. They're just gone. And it's just like, mm. where, what, what happened to them? And then come to find out that a lot of these women, they disappeared because the PED use led to hormonal issues. And now they're in a spot where they're depressed, where they can't, they can't even get in shape, never mind compete. They can't even lose enough body fat to feel comfortable in a bikini again. So, you know, competing I started, is, you yeah. know, and Jamie, just to hear you say that, competing itself, regardless of you're enhanced or not, is hard. It's yes. hard work. You know, I've seen people come and go in this industry just from hardcore dieting, stupid dieting. I mean, and there's so much yep. crazy bro science out there from just a nutrition and training standpoint. I can only imagine adding enhancement in there for, you know, for example, like, you know, do you remember Ephedra? I don't know. I maybe. do. Yes. Okay. So Ephedra yep. at one point was legal and that was like mm -hmm. an amazing, it was an amazing product. And I remember coming off a show and I, and I just didn't know any better. So I just went cold Turkey off of Ephedra and I yeah. couldn't get out of bed for like two days. This was yeah. Ephedra. So I can't right. imagine what happens when you're coming off of these things. And I'd love to kind of talk about what exactly are these things. So you know, there's performance enhancing drugs and most people like steroids. Everything is steroids. Okay. Is it there's steroids? Is there other things besides steroids? What are steroids? So can you share some of the specifics of what exactly people are using to dial in for a show? So, you know, now there's actually, you know, back in like the beginning of bodybuilding in the eighties and the nineties, it was more basic where you had people were basically using anabolics, you know, back then, I guess some people were also using things like growth hormone, um, but there wasn't as much as there is now. And now there's also Why is that? this, well, so now we have the internet, right? Where back in the 80s and the 90s, if you were to get bodybuilding drugs, if you say you were a woman that competed and, you know, say you want to do Anavar, well, you would have to know some guy at the gym or like, you had to know someone in order to get the drugs, right? So it wasn't easily accessible, where now, A, you have new compounds that are, that are being created. So you've got pro-hormones, you have SARMs, you, have, you still have anabolics and all of these things, and you have the peptides, you have anti-estrogens, uh, fat burners, you have thyroid medications. So you've got all of these different compounds and now you have the availability of them. Because Do you really now need you can, all of that? Do you really you need all of here's that? Here's the thing, you can, you, can compete, it, you can compete and not use anything. And I have, I have plenty of competitors that I prep and they are completely 100% natural. They compete in natural organizations. Um, and they do well and they love what they're doing and they get great results. They love the way that they look. It really depends on what federation you are going to compete in, where you're going with the sport, what your goals are, and, you know, what you are willing to risk in your health, in your longevity, in your femininity. All of these things you need to take in consideration if you're actually going to use PEDs. And I can't wait to deep dive into those specifics in a little bit. So when you yeah. were talking about um, enhancements, so there are the natural organizations and they're 
they're very, very particular. So it's no, interesting though, no, because um, no, I, I will tell you what, you know, what's really funny is I do a course of, for women about PEDs and anabolics It's called the, I call it my ABC primer to PEDs. And you wouldn't believe how many WBFF girls have taken my course. So WBFF organization... doesn't drug test. They don't uh, drug test. They're, su- they're supposedly a natural organization. No. So, you know, it's <laughs> like, you've also got to be careful. Yeah, <laughs> WBFF is, those girls are all using stuff. It's not a natural organization. Um, so, so I competed was, it, as a pro in the figure yeah. category on the, in the it's, WBFF. It's a, it's a shame, and it was, though, because I feel like, Here's the thing. I am not pro anabolics. I'm not anti or or like peds. I'm not pro peds. I'm not anti peds. I'm, I am know everything you possibly can. So you can make an informed decision for yourself and what, what is good for you, your health, your, your lifestyle, everything. But I'm not pro or anti, but I, what I am anti is if you're going to compete in a natural organization or an organization that the rules are, you can't use PEDS, then don't freaking, don't fucking use PEDS. Sorry. Excuse well, me. I, like, no, like, don't please. use PEDS. Girl, I am like, with you on that. I don't care what people Compete in an do. organization you have, where there's it's a legal. place for ev- there's a place right. for everyone. But yes, if you're in and the thing is even the natural organizations have time frames. So, I think, you know, on average I'll say 7 years for example. You right. have to have not been using something for 7 years, but we're going to talk about the changes and how some of these things are are permanent. So, right. You know, even you could be natural, but in some people use that as like a as a loose term now. I'm hearing people say when they're off their PEDs, they're calling themselves all natty. And it's just it's interesting to see this evolution that's going on right now. But yeah, the natural federations do drug test, urine tests. They do um, do the spot testing, like I mentioned in the beginning of the show. Mm -hmm. But the non drug tested federations are the ones that are huge. And they have right. a tremendous amount of notoriety. So do you think that affects people's willingness to maybe compromise things that they might not have because of the notoriety that goes along with larger federations? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that if you are going to compete in one of those bigger federations that allow drugs, you are going to, you know, be kind of like edged a little bit more to actually use. But It also, you know, what you should do is more take in consideration what is it that you're, what are you, what is your ultimate goal with the sport? What are you really getting out of competing? Because there's a huge difference between a woman who is like myself, that I knew when I started competing that competing was going to be part of my career. I knew that competing was going to help my coaching business. I also knew that I wanted to compete at the Olympia level. And that that was genetically an option for me, that I was genetically blessed that Mm. I was actually able to make it to the Olympia. So, you know, with all of those things, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit more risk. I also don't want children. So my fertility is not an issue for me as well. So, you know, for me, taking more risk and using PEDs was reasonable for the goals that I have and where I was going with the sport. But there's, there's a huge difference between me and maybe the mom who is doing like her kids finally, you know, she's got empty nests now. So now she can finally do something for herself. She's been working out for 20 years. Now she finally is going to do that show. She's going to do women's physique because she's more muscular. She's been training for 20 years. And you know, now she's, she wants to do it as a bucket list because now she can finally put the time into doing what she's wanted to do. Am I going to give the same cycle to her as I'm going to take? No, no. Is there and, like a, is there some sort of staples that are part of cycles? Like, you know, no. I mean, anabolics, the way cutting agents, for, diuretics. For myself, like the way that I coach my clients is not necessarily the way that everyone else does and the way that it should be. Like, I don't think everyone's doing it the right way is what I'm trying to say is that the way that I see that you should go about going into anabolics and what you should use and what you shouldn't use is again, based on the individual, what is their specific goal? What is their actual potential? What is Mm -hmm. like, where are they going with it? Because again, 
you know, for someone like myself using PEDs, that risk can be high and in that like, but I'm okay with that. But for that mom who's doing it as a bucket list, well, honestly, if you've never competed before, try competing without the drugs first. And then Why see is that if, not I promoted, mean, Jamie? Don't, I mean, have, aren't you... I feel I like it's it. like the first, well, you do, which is why you're here. Yeah. Cause I, cause you, you, you are honest and you tell, and you actually do genuinely care about people, especially, right. you know, you've got this movement about um, saving women's femininity. So, you know, and I have a lot of respect for that. And, and, but I do feel like, I remember having a conversation with a friend. She's, she competed on the Olympia stage for, in the physique category herself. And I remember um, she went to a workshop and somebody at the workshop said to her, so what are you doing? And she was like, what do you mean? At that time, she wasn't, you know, using anything. And uh, I don't believe she has at all. And she says that the the person, her his automatic response to her was, oh, well, you're not going to be ready. Just like mm-hmm. that. Oh, well, you're not. Oh, well, you're not going to be ready then. Wow. So do you feel like there's some encouragement that's going on that is perhaps maybe continuing this uh, uh, direction of of more and more and more of PEDs? I, I do feel like there are some coaches who are like that. And I wish it wasn't so. Uh, I actually was just on a prospect call with someone just last week. And she's like, oh my God, I'm so happy to talk to someone like you because the last girl that, I, you know, she was interviewing another female coach before me. And this is a female coach. And this female coach was, you know, like, these are all the drugs you're going to be doing. And, and like, if you're going to do drugs and fuck it, you might as well get all the sides and just go all in. And you're going to be like, on, literally on anabolics down. all year round. And it's the complete opposite of the way that I think uh, that women should, or really anyone should go about using PEDs, especially if you want to be around for a long time. I mean, That's and now we've got to we've got to really think about what's going on in the world of bodybuilding right now. We're seeing all of these very young athletes, you know, in their 40s, early 50s who are dying in their sleep overnight. Yeah. Um, so it's like, you you know, you can't take these things lightly and you've got to make sure that you are with a coach that. If you say that you're not comfortable doing something, that they respect that and Mm. they can either explain to you why they want you to do something that, you know, they're suggesting. Um, But you've got to have like if you don't have good communication with your coach and and you're telling your coach that you don't want to do something or that these are my limitations or like better yet, if your coach isn't even asking you what your limitations are for your femininity for what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do, then you you probably should find a new coach because those are very baseline questions for a coach. If I'm going to be giving someone a PED protocol, I need to know what is your idea of of what femininity is? Because that's not, that's Jamie, Jamie, what percent, what percentage of of coaches do you think are, I hate to say the word bully, but I'm going to use that as an example. I talked about episode two of my podcast. It's called the the death of credibility. I'm personally mind blown with how many people are out there. Like they know what they're talking about and they have no credibility. I don't even know if they know human physiology to to begin with, but you put put coach up there next to their name on, you know, social media and put throughout a bunch of pictures of fancy clients with trophies. And next thing you know, they're the person to coach with, but I'm seeing a lot of, I'm going to say the word bully because I don't have another word for it where it's like, you should be grateful to work with me type of attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's that intimidation that goes along with it. And again, PED or not. So right. I can only imagine what's going on with, with women who want to win. And, and I don't know, what, what is it with the bullying and women uh, getting you know, blindsided and I've, just following it, along with it? You know what? I don't, I don't coach like that at all. So when I hear <laughs> these stories of these women who are being bullied, it really like, A, it appalls me that a coach would actually do that to someone. Um, because that's not my coaching method at all. So right. that whole bullying is like, I don't understand it at all. And, you know, why women tolerate it is really a question they need to ask themselves. Why don't you feel like you have agency to, to listen, like competing is freaking hard. You are sacrificing yeah. time, money. Uh, you know, you're, if you are using PEDs, maybe your femininity, your health, all these other things. So if you're going to compromise and put all of that into a prep, 
but you're with a coach where you feel like you have no agency and you can't like openly communicate with them. Well, I'm sorry, sister, but that's on you. Like yeah. some, you know, competitors also have to take responsibility for themselves. If, if you have a coach that's bullying you, well, guess what you need to do? Put on your big girl pants and stand up for yourself and say, hey, listen, <laughs> I don't like the way you're talking to me. This is not a good coaching relationship. And you know what? I'm not going to pay you anymore. I'm going to go find someone else who does want to communicate with me. And that is going to take the way that I feel into consideration because this is my body. This is my journey. I'm putting so much into this. I'm not going to let some fucking asshole tell me what I can and cannot do. So it's it happens like, all the time. I think a lot of this is also well, bodybuilding I, is I word think, of mouth. What I think doesn't right? happen enough is I think women like they're okay with this victim mentality of, oh, poor me. I had this coach that made me do this. And I had this coach that did, it was a bully to me. Girl, like you're the one fucking paying them. Like don't be his client anymore. Uh, you know, so it's like, I, I wish that like, what I really would like to see is for women to have some more agency of, of their own and to stand up for themselves because- So how can listen, they do that? Because this is a word of mouth sport. So there isn't a lot of really credible people out there. There, there right. isn't. And of such as, I mean, you, you are, which is what, why, you know, again, you're here today, but there, there isn't. So when people are getting introduced to the sport, it's usually by a friend or somebody at the gym right. or a coach or a trainer and a trainer who's, who's all of a sudden never coached anyone for a competition before is all of a sudden telling you to have 800 calories and do two hours of right. cardio and get to your show. And you don't, you think, oh, well that's bodybuilding. Cause everybody's got the woe is me you know, bodybuilding's right. hard, you know, I'm going to be starving and, you know, and all of this. And, and people really get onto that like pity party. So without there being a lot of uh, coaches that are credible, a lot of people just, I don't know if they know the difference that there is that option to get out there. What do you think? I think that a, like I know for myself as a coach, I don't let anyone sign on with me until I've had a call with them. They need to talk to me. So it's like, Depending on your level of what kind of coaching you want, do you want a coach where you can just go to their website, click, and, and all of a sudden you're their client and they're not going to ask you any questions and you've got a plan in five minutes? Yeah, Is that what you like? That's not very custom, right? Like that's <laughs> not going to, they're not taking anything about you into consideration. I and word on the street is the plan them. is the same as somebody else's. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what's, what's crazy to me is I actually signed on with a, I was trying to just like get ready for a photo shoot this summer. And I was like, you know what, let me just hire a coach just so I don't want to think about it. Like I'm one of those people where I'm way better off with a coach because I don't like, I do everyone else's plans and I'm doing everyone else's stuff all day long. I don't want to have to deal with mine. Could I do it? Sure. But I, it's, you know, I just like it better when I have someone else doing it. So I hired a, a coach that I had known of for years, not a huge name, but like a, a moderate name coach. Um, and like, you know, I have known other athletes that have worked with him. They've had great experiences. So I was like, you know, well, I'm going to give him a shot for this like short little like, you know, cut I'm going to do. And I sign on with him and he doesn't ask me for blood work. He doesn't ask me what kind, like what I'm okay with using, what I'm, what I'm not okay with using how much I'm eating at that time, how much, like, no, Interesting. no information at all. And I got a plan in like an Seriously? hour and it had a drug protocol, diet, cardio, like everything. And it's like, so what'd you think of the drug protocol? <laughs> it was, it was, that's the thing is like, the was drug it terrible? Protocol was more, it wasn't terrible. So it, <laughs> I've seen much worse, but it was beyond what I was comfortable with at the time, you know, really? getting ready so for just... a photo shoot. I don't need to, to put myself at risk to do a photo shoot. Right. Um, mm. you know, it, it's, so it's like, you know, there was no customization. There was no, um, you know, consideration of what I'm comfortable with or what I'm not comfortable with. Right. So I think when you're signing on with a coach, are you getting a call with that coach? When you have the call with the coach, do you feel like they're listening to you? Do you feel like this is a coach that, is going to take in consideration all of your concerns. Are they willing to educate you about the things you don't understand? You've got to ask these questions. So it's like going into the world of bodybuilding, you've got to do your research. And if you're sometimes your research means that you're getting on a call with that coach, if they're not willing to get a, on a call with you, well, do you really want a coach that isn't willing to do that? 
Um, well, what about and the protocol that you were given? Questions. Yeah, what, and the protocol that you were given, it sounds like it was generic. So it was. again, trying to educate the people that are laymen who don't know what these protocols are. What is a common anabolic? What is a common this, that, and the other thing? What are common um, PEDs that would show up on a plan like the one you got? So uh, for on that plan specifically was Anavar, which is an anabolic. So the anabolics were Anavar and Primabolin. Um, and then there was, uh, anti-estrogen was Nolvidex and which like, I didn't even want to have to use Nolvidex. Like I just wanted to, you know, not even have to, to go there with that. Um, and then, uh, I believe that he had Clen on there as well, which that's, you know, for a cut, that's pretty generic and normal. Um, and what does so that Clen was do? like, what do they each a, do? What's the purpose so of them? So the, the anabolics, so that's the anavar and the primabolin, those are going to be the things that are going to help you build and retain muscle. So they're okay. helping you recover faster from training. And it's also allowing you to retain the muscle that you have while in a calorie deficit. Um, those compounds, you know, something like anavar and primabolin, those are both compounds that are commonly used for women in a cutting phase because the anavar is going to give you like a an artificial hardness to your muscle and the like prima bolin is going to give you like a 3d kind of like pop look to your muscle so it does they do kind of not only help you retain that muscle and help you recover faster from your training but it's also going to give your muscle a certain look that you can't get as a natural athlete um okay. And so, you know, you've got that bonus, like added bonus to that. And then, you know, Nolvidex is a uh, CERM. So it's a selective, uh, estrogen, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulator. So if you think about estrogen in a woman's body, and the reason why we're using something like Nolvidex is because when you're trying to diet down and you're a woman, um, that like your estrogen related fat stores are like your butt and your thighs, um, your hips, and taking something like Nolvidex can help reduce that estrogen related fat stores. And that does that by taking the like, you know, you've got all of your estrogen hormones that are kind of like floating around in your body, right? And you have all of these receptors that the estrogen is binding to in different sites all over your body, right? So what the Nolvidex is doing is it is recepting or it's binding to those receptors so that the estrogen does not bind to those receptors. So you still have all your estrogen is still floating around and your estrogen is still being produced in your body. It's just that you are not, it's not being bound in those receptor sites anymore because the Nolvidex is doing that for you. And so that allows you to you know, lose a little bit more of that body fat from those estrogen related fat stores. So that's what the Nolvidex is doing. Usually you'll see that at the last, you know, unfortunately, in some cycles, I'm seeing it like for an entire prep, but it really should be like the last like eight to 10 weeks of a prep. Does your um, estrogen go to zero when you take something like Novidex? No, because again, your estrogen is still going to be floating around in your body. You're still going to be producing estrogen. So your estrogen's not going to go to zero. You just aren't going to be like those, the estrogen, you're going to have a lot more free estrogen. You're not going to have as much bound estrogen in your body. Okay. And then the last one was clenbuterol. The clenbuterol. What does that do? So that is going to help you burn more fat. So that's more of a fat burner. It's got a little bit of an anabolic uh, component to it, but it's mostly just for fat burning. So that's going to help boost your metabolism so you can actually burn more fat. Um, and it's actually like was in medical uses, uses a bronchodilator. So they use it for people with asthma, it opens up your airways. Um, but it will make it so that you can burn fat more efficiently. Um, and now you know, all the th three at once, everything, all at three once. at once. Yep. And how does that affect your psychology? Does it? Mm. It definitely does. And I, I say this to women all the time is figure out what you're okay with compromising before you start anabolics, because when you start anabolics, because here's the thing. Before you start, you might, you know, I, I see women who might say, all right, well, I don't want my voice to change. 
right? And then all of a sudden they start a cycle, like a mild cycle, right? And then all of a sudden the, I call them the contest prep blinders come on. And that's really the androgens affecting your, your brain chemistry. It, it's going to affect the decisions you make. It's going to affect the way that you think about things, the way that you feel about things, your drive, your motivation. Um, it's going to improve drive and motivation, but it may also, like what I see a lot of is once the women get on the anabolics, all of a sudden it's, oh my God, I will do anything it takes to win. I will do anything it takes to win. And that's where you see them, oh, well, now I'm just going to take more or now mm -hmm. I'm going to take this. Or you have the coach that says, all right, well, things aren't looking the way I want it to look. Why don't we add this in? And they have the co those contest prep blinders on and they're like, yes, I'll do it. And then their voice changes. And then after the show, when they get off that high school auditorium stage, they did not win the plastic trophy. And <laughs> now they get off the stage and their voices change. And maybe even some of their facial features but have changed. do they changed. hear it and see it? I have to ask because I see uh, girls I'm, that are in 20 years old know. on social media and they're posting. I don't know. They, they, look, so, they look nothing like before. Do they, do they not hear it or see it? Is it the, the press goggles? Women... I think that most women can hear it when they hear their own like recording on, you know, like say if they make a YouTube video or an Instagram, I think they can hear it there, but I don't think as, as it's happening, it's not easy. It's not super easy to recognize except for, you know, when I'm coaching women and voice is a concern, then I ask them when they're starting, do you, do you notice any cracking in your voice? Cause the first thing that's going to happen is when you laugh or when you sing, your voice is going to start cracking before it actually starts to change. Like the, and why is that? Down. Why is that? It, it, that's yeah. how it first starts. I don't know the exact mechanism behind that. Um, Interesting. But that's where it'll, that's where it'll first start is you'll start to get a cracking when you sing or when you laugh. And if, if the, your voice is your concern at that point, if you get that cracking, then you need to stop taking the anabolics because otherwise is you might end up with the, that side effect forever. Now, do people get that? I mean, side effect for uh, like the voice, for example, is that everyone or are there people that actually don't have that issue? There, It's not everyone. Some people really? can take anabolics and not have their voice change. Nothing. What are not, the I mean, side effects? Here's the thing. There's only so much you can do without having that side effect as a woman. Um, hmm. You know, you can probably get away with using very small, mild doses, of very mild compounds for short periods of time. But once you start stacking compounds, using compounds for long periods of time, there's going to be no avoiding it. Um, you know, so it, it's really going to depend on how you design your, how you design all of your cycles, how long you're running it for, how long, how much time you're taking off in between cycles. Um, I think that's one thing that a lot of women forget too, is your time off is just as important as your time on. Uh, because mm -hmm. you cannot stay on these compounds year round. Um, it is not healthy for you. It is not good for you. And it, it'll, it'll eventually catch up with you. And that's where we Are there any see health benefits at all? Or is it strictly to win? All, all year round? No. No, just the, just, just the compounds themselves. Is there any, are there any health benefits at all? Or is it strictly to uh, achieve a physique that will get on an Olympia stage or a pro stage or, or anything, whatever the goal is? I mean, I suppose if you think of a benefit of like being more muscular is a benefit, right? Because you've got more skeletal muscle, more skeletal muscle mean your metabolism is going to run faster. You're going to be able to eat more food. So mm. in that aspect, yes. But is it, you know, is it like good for any of your internal organs or your heart or anything? Like, no, no, it's, it's detrimental to all of those things, especially when you're using them for long periods of time and and not taking the breaks and not properly PCTing the way that you should. Now, what about the men? How do the men get into it? And, you know, their cycles are, are and what their protocols are. Are they very different than what uh, the women go through and encounter? So they should be very different. Okay. Are they always very different? No. Uh, you know, so the problem is that the way that men respond to anabolics is very different from the way that women respond to anabolics. Uh, and the, what we see, like one of the biggest things that I see all the time is you've got some gym bro who competes and all of a sudden he starts dating this girl who, you know, she's got, she starts going to the gym and he's like, oh, just take what I'm taking. 
and she ends up taking testosterone and trend and all these other compounds that women really should not be doing, especially if you care about your femininity uh, or your health or your fertility. Um, so there so, are known compounds that women should absolutely not touch yes, that are okay absolutely. for men. Okay. Yes. And okay for men, it depends on, again, like what is that man's goal? Is it to compete or is it just for to, to look good on the beach? It depends. You know, I'm not going to give a guy who just wants to look beach ready, uh, you know, the same cycle as I'm going to give a pro bodybuilder. Two totally different people with two totally different needs, right? The guy who's going on the beach, I might just give him uh, TRT, like testosterone replacement therapy. I don't know, maybe a little bit of Anavar if he wants to harden up a little bit. And then for my pro bodybuilder, well, we might have him on three, four, five, six different compounds, depending wow. on what level he's at and what comfort level, he, you know, what his blood work look like. Um, you know, what's his comfort level of what he's willing to use? What things have he used in the past that work really well for him? But I think the important thing is that for women to recognize that a man, like if you are trying to do the same cycle that a dude is doing, you are going to end up a dude. Like your blood work is going to look like a man's blood work. So like a chemical you, sex change, you mean? Yes. Like, that's what I like to call it. The chemical sex yeah. change. Uh, <laughs> You know, so it's like, you've got to be really careful. You can't run the same things your boyfriend or your husband runs. Um, you know, How for does women. It affect relationships? So Ooh, just, that's a, yeah. That's so a good going one. into, yeah. So the relationships from uh, talking from a men's pers male's perspective to his spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend and vice versa for women. I mean, and I can't how about you too? On, I mean, I can't speak share. on like male, like, you know, a partner that, you know, has a, I, and I think it really depends on the couple too. Um, I know for myself, like when I was married, that's when I first started using anabolics. And my husband at the time, he actually like made me write down like the things I was okay with, the things I wasn't okay with, why I wanted to use. Um, you know, he even like made me do a lot of research. I had to like, he made me go through a lot of like jump through a lot of hoops and stuff to make sure I was making the right choice for myself because wow. he knew a lot more about it than I did. And mm. he didn't want to feel like he was pushing me to do it, right? So uh, I know in my relation, like in that relationship, my husband was very supportive. And when I started using, he was very supportive. And he was, you know, kind of like, less is more. Let's like see what we can do with the least amount of stuff that we can give you. And luckily, I was like a super responder. So I respond to like really well to not a lot of stuff. Um, but then as, you know, as I started getting further and further in my competition, uh, you know, career, and I started doing better and better, you know, there, we had a lot of other like marriage issues, but um, he would say that when I was in prep and when I was on the anabolics, um, I was not as like soft, like, and not uh, physically soft, but like emotionally soft. I wasn't as... So like when we think about cold. how, yeah, like when you think about uh, what the, like a traditional mother is, right? Very mm -hmm. nurturing, caring, very um, empathetic, you know? So think about this, all like there's a hormonal component to that. Women mm -hmm. were designed to have more estrogen and part of you having higher levels of estrogen makes you so that you are more mothering and nurturing. And that's important for the evolution of humans because women need to be rears of children and small children. So we need to have that and we need to have that extra estrogen. But, and then when we think of like traditionally, what, like if we think of the traditional male, he is the provider, protector, aggression, right? Like traditional male, like things that you kind of are like driven and all these other things that you're thinking of traditional male attributes, there's a reason behind that. More testosterone is going to create more of that. And again, for the evolution of humankind to keep on, like to survive, we needed to have mothers that were nurturing and men who were protectors to protect those women nurturing those babies. So, so that changes then, when you go off? Well, listen, so, so listen, so, well, then you take a woman and you, t you cut back her estrogen by giving her estrogen blockers, you increase her testosterone, 
And what are you going to get? You're going to get less nurturing, less of that soft, and more of that driven, hard, cold, um, you know, when you're on a cycle. So, you know, is it going to change who you are completely as a person? No. And, you know, one thing that I would say often, especially to like male bodybuilders was, you know, if you are not an asshole, then anabolics aren't going to make you, they're not going to make you like a complete fucking asshole. But if Jamie's you're already threshold, kind of, are you an asshole? <laughs> well, that's the thing is like, if you're kind of a jerk, then you're adding be the a anabolics jerk. is just going to amplify your, your jerkiness. And oh, like my ex-husband is a great example of this because, and he's, he's a much different person now. So like, I can talk about him like this. Um, but, and so he's completely changed now if anyone knows him now. Um, and like he's single ladies, he's a great guy, good catch. Um, but back in the day before all of that, he was like, he was a jerk, right? He was like kind of an mm. asshole even before the anabolics. And then you add the anabolics on top of that. Whoo, he really? was a major jerk. So really? it's like, it's just going to amplify what you already are. Right. Um, mm. but so yeah, it will, it will change you know, kind of like your, it can change your dynamic in your relationship. If you are more of the nurturer in your relationship and all of a sudden some of that is kind of like pulled back because of what you're doing chemically in your body. Yeah. That can have an effect. Now, does it have to, and does it have to be detrimental to your relationship? No. You know, that's also a result of good communication, good partnership, being able to be open with your partner about, you know, how each other is feeling and, and what's going on in your body and, and how you're acting towards them. You know, I feel that, and, and that's really helpful because the, um, to hear that you just say there has to be the communication. I think whether you're on PEDs or not, I think people need to communicate more personally. Oh, hell yeah. You know, but I'm, here's the thing with PEDs. Aren't they illegal? They, but, well, some of them are. are um, or is it prescription so, okay, so some of them are illegal. Some of them are gray area. So when we're talking about PEDs, we're also now, we're now also talking about peptides and SARMs. And peptides and SARMs, and I, I love the people who say that they're natty and yet they're using SARMs. And it's like, okay, no, what is you're a not SARM natty. and what is a peptide? So a <laughs> SARM <laughs> is a selective androgen receptor modulator. So essentially what they tried to do with SARMs when they created SARMs was they tried to only have like the anabolics, but like they, they were like taking the anabolic, but only having it recepted or bind, binding in certain receptor sites. So it's a selective androgen receptor modulator. So you're selectively going to be letting these androgens bind to androgen receptors, but only in certain places. So they're designed to only be bind, like being bound to the receptors in your muscle sites. But unfortunately, it doesn't really work that way. People think they can use SARMs and not get side effects and not get virilization and not like affect their internal organs. But That's how it's sold. what I'm seeing, what I'm or seeing said. is that the blood work from women who use SARMs are usually worse than women who use anabolics. Because what they about are their not blood work? So their liver enzymes are elevated, their hormones are uh, jacked up in some way, their kidney uh, values are, are, do not look good, their blood lipids are off. So, and these are things that we see with anabolics as well. Same thing will happen. Um, only I'm seeing it worse with the SARMs because generally when you are taking an anabolic, you know what it's going to do to your body, right? You know, it's going to affect kidneys. You know, it's going to affect heart. You know, it's going to affect liver. So what do you do? You take preventative over-the-counter uh, supplementation in order to kind of combat that while you're on cycle. But because you have all these women who think that SARMs are magic and you don't have any side effects, they aren't taking any preventative care when they're, when they're taking the SARMs. And so I see the blood work from women who take SARMs, and it's usually always worse than the women who are on anabolics. Um, that yeah. and, you know, the, another thing that I don't care, like, why I don't like SARMs is with SARMs, like if you order SARMs from somewhere, I can't test and see if that Austrian is Austrian. But 
if I buy Anavar from an underground lab, I can get a testing kit and I can test that Anavar and see if it's really Anavar. So you can actually get a com- testing kit from somewhere, or is that yes, another purchase uh, online? Ro- Roidtest.com. Okay, interesting. And then peptides. What are peptides used for? So peptides are like long chain amino acids, and they're it's almost like a, a growth hormone, right? Where you it's it's using those peptides in order to get certain muscle growth or to uh, accelerate fat burning. So peptides, generally, you're going to be injecting peptides. um, And there's all different types of peptides. There are peptides that are geared more towards, uh, you know, repairing muscle injury. So you've got things like TB500, BCP157. So those are like, they call them like the Wolverine um, peptides because they help rebuild uh, soft tissue and collagen, and they can oh, help with injuries. And and actually, like I use both of those uh, after all of my surgeries, and they helped me recover from surgery faster. So and why are those banned? Those sound like they're beneficial health wise. Uh, that you'd have to ask the federations. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Are there uh, side effects to that? Like, what's the bad thing? To well, the, the bad thing is to your the TB soft and going to get better. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for the TB and the BCP one fifty seven, those are generally like very they're very safe. Uh, you know, no real side effects that you need to worry about. Um, hmm. And a lot like there's, I mean, a huge use of that in uh, there's a lot of actual like studies um, of you know, medical studies using these peptides in order to, you know, repair labrums, uh, repair torn muscles. So if you have an injury using something like the TB500, the BCP157 can really accelerate your healing. Um, But then there's also things like FRAG that helps with more fat burning. Um, You've got the uh, IGF and DES or IGF LR3 and DES and those work much like insulin and like growth hormone. Um, so they're going to help build more muscle, burn more body fat at the same time. The DES is something that I like to use a lot, especially with my women who want to bring up specific body parts, but don't want to use anything hormonal. So they don't want any any like possibility of virilization. Um, and that's, those are, you know, the peptides are really great for women who want to use something, but they don't want to use anything that's going to compromise their femininity. It sounds and not a lot of variety. Com- Cause you mentioned on one end, you talked about soft tissue repair for healing, yep. especially after surgery. And then over on an opposite spectrum, you talked about, uh, fat burning. So I can see, okay. Yeah. So I can see how that, um, if you're thinking of natural organizations and how they're trying to take away any sort of unnatural competitive edge, I guess I'm just speaking, you know, uh, what I think is what the, their reasoning behind it. So having said that, I can see how the ones over here, but the ones for soft tissue, I just, it's, it's just interesting to me. Like that doesn't sound like a bad thing. And I would think that yeah. if you're on anabolics and you're growing, do you feel that you're growing past your genetic potential? So if you're doing that, your soft tissue, you know, is being affected by that. So is it, are you past your genetic potential when you're taking anabolics and is it affecting um, your soft I mean, tissue? I, I suppose like, I suppose you are, uh, you know, more than your genetic, you know, because genetically, if you didn't have the anabolics, you wouldn't be growing the size that you're growing. Um, it also depends on, you know, are you someone who you've worked out in the gym for one year and then you started? anabolics Mm. because at that point you haven't even tapped out your natural potential yet Mm. so are you then are the anabolics really helping you go beyond your your genetic potential no because you probably didn't even hit your natural potential yet um so they're that's what do you think is going to happen to somebody like that who hasn't even hit their genetic potential and they're taking all these um anabolics is that almost stunting what they could potentially do or you think it's just expediting their progress No, I don't think it's stunting. It's definitely not stunting what they can actually do, but you, you're putting yourself at more risk before you need to. It's like, I always encourage women, like you've got like tap out that natural potential first, see what you can do without the drugs, because you might not even need them if you're doing the right thing. So, you know, the thing that I see a lot with women, especially like bikini competitors is they will diet all year long. They will do tons of cardio all the time. 
They will barely eat anything all year round, but they want to run anabolic so that they can gain more muscle. Well, it's like, well, sweetheart, back off the cardio, eat some fucking food. And guess what? <laughs> You're probably going to grow. Eat so some it's fucking like, food. <laughs> right? Like, you know, it's, it's, like stop dieting oh, year round. Funny. Stop competing. Like stop doing 12 shows in a year. Oh my God, um, the cardio, you might the actually be able stop. to grow. Yeah, right? So it's like, be, he, we only want to, like, here's the thing. Anabolics and PEDs, they need to be supplemental to an already good plan, to an already good cardio program, diet program, training program. They're not going to do the work for you. Uh, so it's like you want these things to be supplemental to what you're already doing. So that means you've got to make sure you're already doing everything you should be doing because – when then when you add the anabolics and if you're if okay so say we're the the bikini competitor that's been dieting for you know 12 months out of the year we're doing an hour and a half of cardio every single day all year round and then we're like well i'm going to start doing anavar in order to build some muscle well guess what you know that like even adding that anavar in you know what kind of results she's going to get not very like she's not going to get great results but you take that same bikini, same bikini competitor and you get her off of the cardio, you start feeding her, get her on a good progressive training program, and then she starts growing. And then you wait until she plateaus and then she's not growing anymore. And then you say, okay, you've been growing for the last two years. Now let's now it's time if you want to start something, we can add in some anabolics. And bam, she's going to get a, a tremendous result from adding that anavar in. But you take that same girl in a different circumstance, and guess what? She's not going to get very good results from that But will anavar. she get will the she side get effects, results? though? She'll get, well, oh, she'll get the so, side effects. It depends, so she'll get, depends she on gets how the she, results, but not the ones she wants. <laughs> well, it, it, depends, right? it also depends on, you know, how much is she using? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there are some women who can use anavar in low doses for short periods of time, and they don't experience any side effects at all. Um, now granted, is like, that why it's a go-to still... like, it, it, again, I don't have the experience with PEDs personally, but when you hear, and I've been in the industry for 20 years, so I talk and I hear, and I, I have a lot of friends and blah, 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 blah. My point is that Anavar seems to be the one that is loosely spoken. Like everyone's like, it's like mm -hmm. the go-to for women, but it is an anabolic, correct? Yes. It so is why anabolic. is it the, why is it the go-to one? Because isn't it still going to give sides potentially? It, it still has to, like, there are some women who, okay, so one thing to understand is that every woman's going to respond differently. Every woman's going to respond differently. There is no, there is no, like, cut and dry, like, when you take Anavar, these are your sides. When you're, when you're at this dose, these are, it doesn't work that way. Everyone's going to be different. I can give you five milligrams of Anavar, and you, your hair might start falling out, your voice might change in the first week, like, it might be disastrous for you where I can take five milligrams of Anabar and I'm like, hmm, I don't really, I'm, I'm a little bit stronger this week. Maybe like nothing else. No, like my hair's fine. My voice fun, like nothing changes. So it really is going to depend on the woman and how she reacts to it. So, so what are the side effects? So if there, if it's nothing blankets you know, and it's different for mm -hmm. everyone, virilization, you mentioned that uh, earlier. Yes. So can we talk a little bit more about side effects? Are you comfortable explaining yeah, what women are potentially, uh, what could potentially happen to them? Yeah. So when we, you know, let's talk about virilization first. So viril virilization is, the male attributes that women will get when they're using anabolics. So you have things like in, these are the things that you can see, right? These are generally not the things that we're going to see in blood work. These are the things that you're going to physically notice uh, like on your body. So uh, hair loss from your head, um, hair growth uh, on your face, chin, chest hair, like everywhere, really like you're just going to grow more hair. Um, mm. I know for myself, like, I have to shave under my chin every single day. I've gotten my upper lip uh, lasered probably like a dozens of times. And, you know, I've got like ch hair that grows on my chest still. Um, so it's like, you know, you'll have that. You'll have like hair will shed or ha like you'll get that receding hairline. Um, voice changes. So your voice will drop. Um, also like clitoral enlargement, clit clitoral sensitivity. So you'll actually get enlargement of like that organ. Um, and again, like that's something that some women 
don't mind at all. That's some, like I know for myself, like it actually made my sex life a lot better. I actually <laughs> orgasm way more than I used to. Um, so for me, it's actually an added plus. It's not something that I see as a negative. Um, <laughs> and, but what I do see is that with, so, especially younger women, I see women in their early 20s who they maybe they have a boyfriend, right? And he's a bodybuilder and he convinces her to do an aggressive cycle. She becomes virilized, her voice drops, her clit gets enlarged and it stays there permanently. Like it doesn't go down after. I was going to ask you and, that. What about the hair receding? And, and, you know, and maybe like, yeah, hair receding, that may or may not. And here's the thing, all of these virilization signs, they may possibly be permanent forever. Um, you know, things like hair loss that usually will kind of subside when you come off of the anabolics. Um, now if you're like receding, like if your hairline starts to recede though, probably won't come back. Will it stop falling out? Like it, like it was when you're on anabolics. Yes. Once you come off cycle, it usually will slow down. Like the, that shedding will slow down. Um, but the, the facial hair growth and stuff, once you start growing hair there, um, when you come off cycle, it might not be growing as fast, um, and as thick as when you were on cycle. But like, if you want to get rid of that, you're going to have to like get that lasered. And then when you use again, it's going to grow back. Um, what about men? So I, what about what their about, side effects? Well, here's the thing. Like virilization is only for women. You know right. why? Because when a man gets more manly, that's just him being a man, right? Like men aren't going to get virilized because they are men. So they're just getting more manly. And that's not counter to their sex, right? What about the breast tissue, though, on the men? Does uh, it so, No. Uh, well, for men, breast, you can get gyno, uh, you know, you can get gyno, from using too, like if a man uses too much, too many anabolics and their androgens get too high, it's going to aromatize into estrogen. And then that's why there, and, and there's perlactin is, is also part of that too. Um, and that's going to make a guy, you know, you know, have that, that gyno, but women, that's not going to happen to, um, and generally, you know, will women, if they use a certain level of anabolics, you're going to start like, yes, you will start aromatizing more. You will create more estrogen, but you don't really see that women's like breasts are getting bigger when they're taking too many uh, androgens. It's more like when a woman's taking too many androgens and it starts to aromatize, it's more like you can look at her and sh like you can see like the, the fat stores in her, like in her hips and in her butt, like will not, you know, she just can't lose that weight. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a lot of that is, uh, you know, because she's aromatizing, too, she's got too many androgens. She's aroma, aromatizing that now into estrogen. Man, this is a lot of chemistry. I don't know how you yeah. keep everything uh, organized. <laughs> many years of doing it, right? Wow. It's <laughs> yes. like, and then you're like, sir, and then you start you're speaking off of this, this one and this one and this one. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> It's a lot. And it's, you know, if you're new in the sport, you know, first of all, if you're new in the sport, like compete without using anything. Like my first show, like I didn't use anything my first show. And I'm happy that I did. And the coach that I had at the time, you know, he's like, you need to see a like if you like it, you know, because again, like, you know, I was talking about the 20 year old whose boyfriend has their use an aggressive cycle, she ends up with an enlarged clitoris. And then, then that same boyfriend, he breaks up with her for some bikini girl. Right. And now she's alone. And, but this is what I see. And this is why I started talking about anabolics, like openly is because that same 20 year old girl who's now virilized now has the enlarged clitoris. Maybe her voice has changed. Whatever's happened to her body. Well, now she's depressed and now she's lonely. And now she doesn't want to date or get naked in front of anyone because she doesn't feel comfortable with what's happened to her body. How often and does that happen? I, I see it really? a lot. I see it far too much. Now you talk about 20-year-olds, um, though, but, but it's yeah. got to be but older than that too, right? I, yeah, all ages. But I think for me, you know, when I see the younger girls going through that, and then they get depressed, and then they ruin relationships, they ruin opportunities for themselves, and their whole life starts to go down this, like, downward spiral. And it's all because 
they they are mad at themselves for the choices that they made that led them to where they are and they aren't happy with the changes that have that have happened in their bodies and that's why i encourage women before you start the anabolics know what you're okay with know what you're okay with changing and what you're okay with com know what is important to you in your femininity what is important to you have that figured out and make sure you tell that to someone who has your best interest in mind and who's going to slap the shit out of you if you start compromising those things. And why are you so passionate about helping women maintain their femininity? Like, I think it's amazing, but I, but what drives you so hard? I mean, you're going live and you're sharing. I mean, you're putting yourself out there and sharing things that no one's talking about. Like it's I, taboo. It's, it's, it's swept under the rug and you're out there on blast. I think it's amazing. It's but Im- again, it's important why? to me because I, because I, once I started talking about it openly, all of these women f- like flooded my DMs and they were telling me their stories of, you know, how they were going through, you know, exactly what I was talking about and how they were depressed and how they, they ruined themselves with this and ruined themselves with that. And I want to, I want to stop that. And mm-hmm. here's the thing. The idea of like, I'm not necessarily trying to like save women's femininity. I'm trying to educate women so that they can make the right choices for the level of femininity that they want to keep in themselves. Because not everyone's idea of femininity is the same. My idea of what makes me feminine is not the same idea of what you think makes you feminine. And that's Mm -hmm. okay. I'm 100% okay with that. If you're a female bodybuilder who gives zero shits about your femininity, go ahead with your bad self, sister. Do whatever the heck you want. But my, like, what I want to do is give women who do want to preserve a certain level of traditional femininity, give them the tools to make the right choices for themselves. Love so that, that way, you know, if your voice is a concern, all right, well, how do you manage all of that? You know, if not losing your hair is a concern, how do you go about using anabolics? How do you do it safely? How do you, how can you do it in a way that's not going to compromise these things? Um, And I think that women need to understand that if you want to be a high level, say you want to be like a high level figure or women's physique, IFBB pro, I will tell you right now, it is very unlikely that you are going to experience no side effects. Uh, you know, getting to that level. Will w- do you have to have crazy side effects and completely ruin yourself? No, but you have to have an expectation of if you're gonna be at that level, unless you are genetically a freak. Um, you you have to assume you are gonna have some sides. Um, you know, do you and, have, and I do think, you think, in your opinion, Jamie, just real quick, do you think mm-hmm. because I I am planning to compete again? It's been. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to say in my 40s that I'm better than I was at 20. So I'm going back on the stage next year myself. I love and it. And I'm going to give it a go. And it's too bad because physique, which we'll, we'll touch on real quick. Um, I love the physique. Well, I started in bodybuilding. The posing, yeah. just everything about it. I love, I love the strength of the posing and just everything about it. And physique, when it first came out in the Dana Lynn Bailey days, when I first saw it, I was like, oh. I could probably do this, but I had all my own life stuff going on. I was going through divorce. I had so much, you know, so much going on personally. There was just no competing for me in the future. At that, and you're at smart that time. for not competing with all that shit going on. Oh my god! And then, and then you come about, and you. Oh, I'm telling you, listeners, if you haven't seen Jamie's photos of her on stage, insanity. I mean, genetically, you are a freak. Like, <laughs> forget I'm, all this. I'm, forget I'm everything. Very you're genetically amazing. Blessed. Oh my Thank God. You. So I'm you're on blessed. stage and I see you and I'm like, there's no freaking way. Because again, I choose, and this is just for me. And it's probably mm-hmm. just because my journey started 20 years ago when it was different. And for me and my, and where everything that I was going through, and I want to try, I want to see what I can do, what I'm capable of. But do you think that, because again, 2017 ish, would you say is when it kind of really shifted to being super, super lean in the physique category? And you attribute yourself to, to that too, because you came in like crazy. Say like, freaky. Yeah. I say like 2016, 17 was about when it, it started to, to change. Um, and yeah, like I was part of, I was, I like to say like, I was part of the problem. Uh, that like I've started, like I was part of one of the ones that created what we're dealing with right now, where they all like these women are super shredded, super hard. Um, and I, I, 
what I think about women's physique and where I would like to see the division go is back to how it was in like, you know, 2015 and 16. I think that you had a, like, you know, Juliana Malacarne as Miss Olympia, who beautiful. like absolutely beautiful, full mm. physique. She had nice separation. She had some striations, but not crazy striated glutes. Um, and like just very beautifully balanced, but that conditioning that she had, that was a beautiful level of conditioning that stunning. she had. Stunning. She was stunning. Um, and, and it's more, and that's a, a level of conditioning that I think is suitable for women's physique. Because when you go beyond that, then we're looking, you're you're essentially the conditioning of a, of a bodybuilder. How do you um, get there? So how do you go from Julianne Mal- Mal- Malacarney? I don't know if I'm saying it right. Uh, how do you go from her to you know, reigning champion, like super, super crazy lean. Well, I think it's been an evolution. And I think that it's, you know, obviously the judges are rewarding it, but we can't blame it all on the judges because guess what? The judges can only judge what shows up that day. Hmm. So if all the women in women's physique don't want women's physique to be as conditioned, guess what, girls? Stop showing up with shredded glutes. All of you. It does still That's say in the de- it. it does say in the description to not have striated glutes. Like it still it says used it. to. They changed did it. Did they change it? I feel like they I just read it. it. I feel like I just saw that. So they did remove that. And yep. did you also notice that the Arnold they removed the whole category? For the Arnold yes. Classic in two thousand. Did you see what Sarah Viegas, the reigning Miss Olympia, did? Yeah, yeah she got some did, balls. She does. So she and go ahead. So twenty thousand dollars she's putting up for the prize money, right? For the prize money, if if the Arnold will have women's physique at the, you know, at the Arnold because she wants to be able to compete there. Um, I honestly, like, I don't have many good things to say about Arnold right now. Um, you know, someone who says, fuck your freedom. Well, he can suck a big fat one for me. Uh, like, I don't know. Like, Guys, I, meet Jamie. Th- she... <laughs> One thing about Jamie is you're always going to know where you stand. So I like that. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, that and it's like, I feel like the Arnold has kind of like made women's physique the black sheep of of bodybuilding for many years now. When we even look at, so the first year they had women's physique at the Arnold uh, was the only year they invited us. So the Arnold is like the second tier down from the Olympia, right? You have the Olympia, then the Arnold's right underneath it. But the reason why the Arnold is right underneath the Olympia is because you had to get invited to it, right? That's what made it a prestigious event. But after the first year that they had women's physique at the Arnold, all of a sudden, all you had to do was was get top 10 at a pro show and you could do the Arnold in women's physique. Anyone when did that could change? Do it. When did that So change? that they started doing that in 2014 or 15. So mm-hmm. I think, no, 14 was the first year they had it at the Arnold and they invited everyone because I had gone, I had tried to get an invite. I didn't get the invite. And then the year after that uh, is when they just let anyone do it. Um, you had to get like top 10. And at that point I was like, well, fuck that. I'm not going to do it. Like it's not prestigious anymore. It's just like any other show. Were there not um, enough people to compete? Was there just not enough competitors if they didn't do that? See, that's what I mean. It's like, okay, well, why are all the other divisions being invited, but we're not? Mm. And then and- all the other divisions, they were paying for their travel. They were paying for their room. They were getting a stipend every day. Not women's physique. Not really? men's physique. Yeah. Huh. And even last so year, which I- was I this year, like- the Arnold, they didn't even have figure this year. No, the Arnold, which I thought was. I feel like as well. you know Arnold is trying to like if you even heard his commentary at the Arnold this year, um, you know he he does not like the direction that bodybuilding is going in. Um, he was the Arnold was also the first uh, show that got rid of female bodybuilding back in two thousand and uh, I think it was. So it actually wasn't the Olympia. It was the Arnold. It was the Arnold that first got mm. rid of it, uh, and that was in like two thousand eleven, twelve ish. Um, so, you know, Arnold, I think he very much like he wants to keep bodybuilding in like the mainstream, right? And when you think mainstream, you like, if another woman who's not in the fitness industry sees a female bodybuilder who competes at like the Olympia level, they're those they're gonna get be fucking scared, right? They're gonna be like, whoa, what the fuck am I looking at? Um, you know, for normal people, 
that look, uh, you know, it's it's a turnoff for a lot of people. And that's why Arnold got rid of female bodybuilding back then. Um, well, even so, well, I Jamie, think even somebody he's like very me, very much about appearances. Well, Jamie, even myself, when I'm when I'm lean for a show, when I last mm. time I competed, for example, I got people in my inbox calling me tranny. Uh, oh, oh, you yeah. must be on drugs. You must be on this. And even if yep. you look at the social media posts when they're they're talking about there's a, a natural Olympia that's going on and um, and and people, everyone's comment like, oh, natural. Uh huh. Like you can't anybody with muscle is automatically assumed to be on drugs. Have you noticed that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I Why? mean, I think where is all that coming from? I don't get it. I don't know. That's a good question. You've got to ask those <laughs> keyboard warriors, man. I think a, a lot of people. There's too many. <laughs> right. Um, but I also think, you know, you've also got a lot of I, I think you've got a lot of people that aren't honest about their use as well. And I think that also confuses uh, like the general public and, and newbies. So one of the people that I despise the most in this sport because they're such a freaking liar is Dana Lynn Bailey. Uh, because girl, you ain't been natty for life. I don't care who you're trying to fool, but you ain't fooling me. Um, and to me, it's, it's, it's a disservice to the women that follow her because I get those women that follow her that say, I want to look just like Dana Lynn Bailey, but I don't want to use any drugs. And it's like, I hate to break it to you, but a Dana Lynn Bailey is not natural. And B, you're not going to look like Dana Lynn Bailey being natural. Like, you can't look like that year round. 100% um, positive? You're 100% positive? Uh, oh, listen, like I said, those anabolics give you a certain density and a certain look to your muscles that you cannot get as a natural athlete. And then okay. you have her making remarks like, oh, it's because I train so hard and I'm so intense when I train. Well, that makes me think even more that you're on drugs. Because a natural person is not going to be able to train their fucking ass off all the time. You're going to run training your ass off to you. Yeah. What's I mean? What's, I don't know. To her, that, well, well a, that's what I mean. Like to her, uh, you know, for her, like you look at her training videos. That's what it means. Um, but, but when it's you're like, enhanced, you're can you train more like often? That, can you train more when often when you're enhanced? Well, yeah. The, the anabolics, like I said, the anabolics are going to make it so you recover from your training faster. So, mm -hmm. you know, anabolics don't do the work for you. What they are allowing you to do, they're allowing you to work harder and more often. So, so what does that mean? Like, can you give an example? So like a Monday through Sunday, what can, um, if you're on a cycle and you are able to recover a lot faster, what does your training protocol look like? It, it, well, just it depends on the, it, well, it still depends on where you are in your prep, where you are like, you know, because towards the end of your prep, even though you're on anabolics, depending on where your cardio is at, where like, how, you know, how much food you're eating, you know, you may or may not be recovering well. So I don't think there's one blanket, like this is how your training protocol is going to look. But let's say, for example, that I'm okay, right now, I'm I'm in like in a cutting phase right now. And before I was on the anabolics, you know, when I train legs, I would be sore for three days after I train legs, right? So now that I'm on a cycle, that now when I train legs, the next day I'm doing the same intensity, same volume, same intensity, my diet hasn't changed. And now when I train legs, I'm not sore the next day. Hmm. Get Can you it? grow faster? So you're recovering faster. So mm -hmm. being able to recover faster means that you can train with more volume. You can train with more weight. You're going to, you're going to be able to recover from those workouts faster. But what um, about so, when you're off? Do you lose all your gains? I mean, you don't clearly lose don't lose all, all of them, them but no, do you, you don't lose all some? of them, but, but what you are going to lose is you're going to lose some of that like fullness of the muscle. You're going to lose some of that, like, again, that, that pop, that density, that hardness in the muscle. Um, you're going to lose that, but you, you know, as long as you continue to train hard and you continue to eat right, you can maintain most of the gains that you have. You're going to lose some of that, like, again, like that artificial fullness, but you'll still keep the size. I've heard of men. And again, I just heard, so I don't know personally that they lose gains when they go off the PED, they're the anabolics. So well, is it just think, because they stopped eating? <laughs> I think one of the biggest mistakes men make is they think that once they come off a cycle that they need to back off of their training. Why? Completely like that that not completely but that they back off so much that they aren't able to even maintain what they gained. Hmm. 
Well, yeah. I mean, if you're backing off, why are they right. backing off? Because they I mean, think that because that's bro, some bro thing that oh. bros say that you should do. I guess. Oh my god, the regulations in this industry, right? Are just, they they're bonkers. But what about? Um, just wondering, a couple safety things. So, who should use PEDs in your opinion? I think that women who have been, you know, have tapped out their natural potential that want to make, you know, something more out of like, you know, I don't think that women who are doing this sport as like a bucket list thing should be using anabolics. Um, I say, you know, figure out if you even like the sport, if you want to keep on doing it before you get into it. Um, so like women who like myself, who like, I'm a coach, I make like, this is going to amplify my career, right? Um, you know, women who are okay with, you know, po possibly not having any more children. Um, I think fertility is something that you need to think about too. If you're a woman who really, really wants, you know, you want to have kids, um, you know, I would have your kids and then compete and do whatever you want to do. Well, why does um, because, it do that? Can you back up real quick about the fertility part? So we'll get into, I was going to ask you about post-cycle therapy, but, um, and I don't know if this is related to that, but it, if you're saying fertility, they should wait until they have their kids until they uh, actually start any uh, anabolics and whatnot. Why? What, what, what happens to make them lose their fertility? So what, you know, doing like one cycle of like Anavar is not going to pro probably is not going to mess with your fertility, right? But what we see is when women use anabolics for long periods of time, they don't cycle off or they don't cycle off often enough or long enough, they don't PCT correctly, you are going to change your hor hormonal profile. And there are a number of different ways that that can manifest. And what you need to understand is that your fertility is linked to your hormonal profile. So if you are messing with that, you are thus messing with your fertility. So, you know, is there one specific thing that I see happen? No, it's all different types of things that I see happen. And it depends on, you know, is it a problem that's caused by them using it for too long? Or did they use too much? Or did they already have PCOS and then they started? So, you know, there's a bunch of different reasons why, but the bottom line is your fertility is, is, you know, it's, is your horm is your hormones basically. Um, and how those work with your, you know, with all your reproductive organs. And if you're messing with that, you can be messing with your fertility and whether or not you're, especially when we start talking more about the anti-estrogens, like, you know, the aromatase inhibitors, that's where I really see women who have problems regulating menstruation after, um, you know, because you're messing with the levels of estrogen in your body. Um, so that can be detrimental to women's fertility. So besides fertility, um, things that five, maybe, maybe five things. So you mentioned, um, for example, fertility issue. If you don't want to have have your children first, yeah. uh, tap out your genetic potential. You were going to say a couple more things, but then we kind of deep uh, dove into fertility yeah, for a so second. Yeah, so making sure that like your hormones are in a good place, you know, getting blood work, making sure that your liver, kidney, heart, uh, you know, that your health, you're in tip top shape. Um, I also like, I know with my clients, I generally like if you're using birth control, um, I would say ditch your birth control first. See if that's why you're not gaining the, the getting the gains that you want. Because birth control is going to, it's designed to make you estrogen dominant in most cases. And it is going to downregulate your natural testosterone production. So instead of using anabolics, why don't you get off your birth control? See if you can get your natural testosterone production up instead of just adding more drugs to the mix. So, you know, that's what I usually recommend, recommend first. So if you're all, if you're, you know, so these things, you know, if you're on birth control, maybe, all right, well, let me try that first and see if I'm going to get the results that I want. Um, and so like hormonal health, their, you know, overall, like internal health is good. And that like mental health, that you mentally are okay with the possibility that these side, like you might get these side effects and they might affect you for life because you don't know, like you're, it's kind of like playing Russian roulette. 
like when you're doing anabolics as a woman, you may or may not get voice changes. You mm. may or may not get clitoral enlargement. And then after you come off cycle, you may or may not be left with your voice change permanently. You may or may not have the, the clitoral enlargement go down. So you're playing with fire. So you've got to ahead of time know if you're okay with that. And, you know, also taking in consideration, are you going to be okay with, you know, if you're someone who answers the phone at your job, if people start calling you sir, um, are you going to be able to handle that mentally? Now, if what about if you're at the grocery store and someone hears you talk or maybe they just think you look more like a dude now and they say, hey, oh, they whisper just loud enough. Is that a man or a woman? Oh my god! Um, you know, you say so it loud like, enough for you to hear. Like people do. Oh people yeah, like these awful. are things that have happened to me clearly. Uh, so, oh my god, you know, Jamie! Like, it, but also being able, like to, to me, it's more of a reflection of that person. Um, mm. But you, like, I'm, I'm a strong person. I'm I was going to say, how are you conviction. so strong? How are you so strong? How are you not falling? Everyone, like if somebody, everyone are mean. is as strong. Everyone is as strong <laughs> as they decide to be. Right? Yeah, y- you're as strong as you decide to be. Um, and I know for myself that these were things that I like, these are things that I encounter. Luckily, I'm completely like secure with who I am and the choices that I've made, but I've seen things like this destroy other women where they have maybe an ex-boyfriend makes a comment on, oh, well, you know, on like one of their posts, oh, like, you know, your voice has changed and like, you're clearly on bold, like, you know, people talking down about your side effects. You've got to be okay with that. Mm. Um, what about when your mother asks you why your voice has changed? Are what you going to be okay? Parents? Have you, have, how do your parents feel about you competing and, and, and everything that we're talking about today? So when I first started competing, they were not very supportive at all. And my, even like my father, you know, would say, you know, don't, don't don't get too muscular. Don't start looking like a man. Don't don't gain too much muscle. I got um, that all the time. <laughs> right. Um you know, and then and then my mother, she's she was very supportive of me competing, but I do remember this one time she uh we were in the kitchen at her place one day and she goes, "Jamie Nicole, whatever you're doing, I just want you to let you know that your voice is changing." And I'm like, Okay. Thank you, mom. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. So it's like, <laughs> but did you, you know already? Be... Did you know that? Or was it, was it the first? I, I did. I knew. Did. I knew. Um, so it's like, are you going to be okay explaining to what if you're, what if you have kids? What about when your kids ask you, mommy, like what's wrong with your voice? Why is your voice changing? Are you going to be able to answer that? Like, are you okay with answering that? Are you okay with having to deal with that? I think a lot of women forget about these things. Um, I also and, think and a lot from- of women may not know because, again, the, even going back to the top of Anabar, people, you know, toss it, the topic around like it's no big deal. Like there's going to be, you know, oh, no, mi- very, very minimal or just any anything like that. You talk about estrogen blockers and not knowing how what your body's what's going to happen when you remove that from your system. Will you be able to be fertile? I, I don't know if people know that. I don't. I mean, education, I agree with you that people need to be educated, but I think it's also turned, it's tossed, the, the terms are tossed around in the industry and made to seem like they're no big deal. And that's why I I'm think part that, of why I'm doing the show, because I want right. people like I, you to help explain, I think educate. That women need to be, they, they need to be their own advocates. Definitely. Um, I think that if you get a plan from a coach and you don't know the the compounds and what they do and your coach isn't willing to explain those things to you when you ask, well, A, get a new coach and like be okay with doing that. Don't just, you know, oh, they're not going to explain it to me. I don't know what it is. Let me just take it. Well, guess what? You're an idiot. I'm sorry, mm. but like, I feel like we need to like, people need to have some responsibility for themselves at some point. It's like, I'm not going to go, you know, same thing. Like I'm not going to go to a doctor and cause trust, I do not believe in, in the medical uh, profession right now at all. Um, You know, I'm not going to go to a doctor and then have them give me a prescription and not look into what it is. Like everyone's got Google these days, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you can look up and you can research anything on your own. 
um, you know, you've got to be your own advocate. And it's just like, you c- don't make the excuse, the bullshit excuse for yourself. Oh, well, I didn't know what it was. Well, guess what, sweetheart? You are your own person. Ask. Mm-hmm. And if your coach won't ask, get a new fucking coach. Like, and, and if you don't voice. get a new coach, then guess what? That's on you. It's on you. Your it's your today. responsibility. I genuinely hope your voice today it, it it speaks loud and clear, and I want this message to get out there as much as possible because whatever your choices are, that's for you to decide. But I right. agree with you that people need – knowledge is power, but maybe sometimes people need to hear this reality and the things that you shared today and the honesty that you did. I can't thank you enough for everything. But people need to maybe have this as a ment- – as a you know, a slap across the head and go, come on, wake up. Like something's not right. Use your intuition. I I did a whole episode on, on that as well about if something doesn't seem right, it's probably not. It's not. It's not. Your gut knows too. I'll tell you a good story about intuition. So I was getting ready. I was like a couple days before the 2017 Olympia and 2017, I was already pre-qualified, gotten fifth the year before. I was looking to place in the top three and I was looking amazing, like the best I've ever looked in my entire life. And so my coach was Matt Jansen and dumbass gets his wife knocked up nine months before the Olympia. And so he has to leave because she goes into labor the week of the Olympia. So he never gets a chance to see me. Right. So I end up sending him pictures the night before the Olympia and he tells me, what to eat. And then he tells me to take a diuretic and like a a prescription diuretic and like a diazide. And I was like, I know diazide, like my intuition, like I could feel it in my gut was like, don't take it. Don't do it. Don't. But I'm like, you know what? Like, I'm just going to listen to my coach. I'm going to do what my coach tells me to do. I ended up taking the diuretic and you know what? I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, looked at my legs and I knew it was over. There was no saving my look. I was flat. I was, I totally missed I, in the, the one hour that it mattered how I looked was the one hour I, I looked my worst the entire fucking prep. And I just um, want to so say like, that that has to really That was a huge really lesson suck. of intuition. Yeah, yeah but, that was I a mean, huge lesson on intuition. Well, to- yeah. that's massive, massive on intuition. But man, Jamie, like, I'm my to spend you, man. all those months preparing. Oh, yeah. All those months preparing to blow it. Like, like yeah. that sucks so bad. Man. But, you know, the and diuretics... What, what, do you even need them? Did you need it? I was so lean. I didn't need them. And it's, it's, it's funny because right after that show, uh, I went to go meet up with John Meadows because he was doing my training at the time. Um, and we were like doing a photo shoot for Granite. I was one of his athletes. So I met up with him right after the show and he goes, he was, he was pissed. He goes, what the fuck did Matt give you? And he knew right away that he had given me a diuretic. Cause he, he's like, he's like, you looked amazing. He's like, you were too lean. When you have someone who's in really good shape, you don't need to take a diuretic. There's nothing, there's no fat for the water to, to re- be retained in, uh, you know? So it's like, uh, it, it can really ruin your look at that point. So I had a posing client, Jamie, I had a posing client. Mm-hmm. She was doing a, her first comp, first competition. Okay. Very first mm-hmm. competition. Um, and I, I prepare people, the stage component for all federations, all divisions, men and women. That's my niche. So she mm-hmm. was comparing, uh, preparing for her first show. And she was kind of one of those very lean, naturally lean people, very long limbed, um, just naturally shredded and turn and her, and her coach gives her a diuretic and mm. I get the stage photos cause I didn't go to the show and I had just seen her like midweek and she looked amazing cause we were, everything was virtual. She looked amazing. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, what happened? Like she, she yeah. physically couldn't lift her arms out. Yeah. And she, she was figure. She could, she couldn't open, she couldn't move her arms. She was like stuck in straight up mo like stiff as a rod. She couldn't move. And I'm like, yeah. why did you even need the diuretic in the first place? You were already lean. So I've, I've always wondered why people just hand out diuretics like candy. I think for, for the most part, they're trying to make up for the conditioning that their client doesn't have. But this girl was shredded and it was yeah, an I amateur stage. Yeah. 
<laughs> I know. I, I don't get it. And then aren't there stories? I don't know I mean, a, a lot of what's going on right now, there's a lot of um, phys- uh, physical issues because of the diuretics, not necessarily anabolics. Yes. People are just saying steroids. But I'm, I'm hearing stories about multiple diuretics used at the same time. And again, all of this sounds like chemistry to me. And I can't even imagine um, organizing all of this stuff. And then now you're adding in multiple compounds for uh, diuretics too? Like, mm-hmm. is that normal? I mean, I don't think that it's normal, but it is, it, it's commonly seen now. Like, unfortunately, it's commonly seen. I don't think it should be normalized. Um, I don't think that it's necessary. I don't use diuretics with my clients at all. Um, I, you know, we use maybe like an over the counter diuretic, something like the M- MHP Expel, um, something like that. But other than that, I'm not using any diuretics with my clients. So, You know, again, when you're hiring a coach, ask them, what are your peak week protocols look like? What do you use with your clients? Uh, Do you use diuretics? What kind of diuretics? Um, You know, ask those questions. And if they're not willing to answer those questions, then you've got to ask yourself, do you really want to be with a coach like that? That's not you're saying you don't even need them. That's what you're saying today. You don't like if you are in the shape that you're supposed to be for a show, you don't need diuretics. What about post-show? I mean, you you have a freebie that you're offering for people about post-cycle therapy. Um, can you share what that is? Well, the freebie, of course, but also what exactly post-cycle therapy is? Because we talked a lot about getting to the show and the compounds. And man, I can only imagine what, you know, I know for personally what it's like to come to dial out of a show emotionally, physically, mm-hmm. just everything. I can't imagine now you've got, I don't even know how many compounds some people are on at once. What's post-cycle therapy and what does that entail? And please so share post- what you have to offer people. So post-cycle therapy is, it's essentially what you're going to take after you, you know, do a cycle in order to get your body back to homeostasis. So we know that doing an anabolic cycle is going to mess with your kidneys, your liver, your hormone health, your heart health. So your PCT is all your supplementation that's going to help correct all of those things. So that way your body gets back to healthy and get gets back to normal. And it, it is essential. For, and like, this is something that wasn't talked about, especially for women. There's PCT for men. They've been talking about that for 20 years now. Um, but for women, this is something that we just started to talk about. Um, because what we see is if you're, if you're doing cycle after cycle without doing the PCT, then you have, you know, you run the risk of like real internal organ damage, like your liver and your kidneys, also heart health, your blood lipids, but also your hormone health. So being able to correct the hormone issues that you're going to see post cycle and, and making sure that you're again, back to that homeostasis, getting your, getting your menstrual cycle again. Um, that's what the PCT is designed for. So long does it last? So anywhere between like six and eight weeks, and then you would get your blood work done. You'd see, okay, did the PCT work? Is everything back into range where it's supposed to be? Am I menstruating again? Um, Is it, is my menstruation at like at the right, is it a 28 day cycle? Where is my cycle right now? Um, And so like, you know, if you get that blood work back after six to seven weeks or eight weeks, Um, if those numbers still look off, well, then that means you've got to run some of that PCT a little bit longer, depending on what is off on your blood work. Right. Um, so it's, it's generally that like, you know, six to eight weeks, but depending on what that blood work looks like after that PCT, you might have to extend that a little bit longer. Yeah. Cause Um, I was going to say six to eight weeks doesn't sound like that long. No, I mean, it doesn't sound like that long. Yeah. But you tell a woman who likes to be on anabolics that she has to be off cycle for six to seven weeks, and she's going to think that's a long time. Why? Because it's addicting. Okay. To look like Superwoman. So, I mean, do you feel like Superwoman? Fuck yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Well, you didn't say anything about that. <laughs> well, again, like... Well, no wonder. The, we added... <laughs> Again, the added androgens in your system are going to make you feel more driven. You're more motivated. You're more hyper-focused on what you're doing. Um, I know for myself, like when I'm on a cycle, like I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit more driven. I'm a little bit more focused on what I'm doing. I get a little bit more done. 
um, opposed to when I'm not. And again, that's the androgens that are, you know, that's, that's part of that chemicals that that's, you know, going on in your brain and how your brain is responding to that. But what about um, the so brain? Is there any sort of brain health that you can do in your post psychotherapy for that emotional component that, that you're explaining? Because that's got to suck. I, I think anybody coming out of a show, seeing their body go from super crazy yeah. freaky is amazing. It's the most incredible ride high yes. you'll ever go on. I mean, I, I love com everything about competing, but coming out of a show is like, ugh. <laughs> I know, you know, and again, uh, okay. So you ask, okay. So you ask like, you know, why a woman like being off for six to seven weeks, why she would say that's a long time. Well, okay. Like same principle is, you know, asking a competitor, do they really like to be in the off season and not be stage lean for however many months out of the year? No, they don't. Right. Because we like looking awesome because we like looking freaking superhuman. And when you're on the anabolics, not only do you have that mental component, but you also have that physical of like, you look fucking amazing, right? Especially if you're doing the right thing. But are like, you like falling apart after the show? I mean, if you're going on post psychotherapy and you're dialing out of a show, regardless, you're going to gain some body fat. But if you're doing it right. in, a, in, a, in a slow, progressive way out of a show, hopefully you're not going to, you know, completely blow up like a stuffed tick. But maybe right. you do because you're coming off certain compounds that are affecting estrogen. I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. But if you do it the right way, it should be, you know, smooth and easy, kind of like what you would expect with a natural athlete where you slowly reverse out of it. Um, again, like there's a couple different components that are different from a natural athlete coming off of a show and an enhanced and, and the natural athlete, like you're going to lose some of your, like you lose your leanness really. And that's about it. Like you're losing your leanness, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. with someone who's doing anabolics, you're, you're losing the leanness, but you're also losing the hardness. You're losing a little bit of strength because the anabolics are going to give you strength. Uh, so you're losing the hardness, the strength, that like density of the muscle tissue. Um, you're going to lose that. And then again, like the mental component, you're going to lose a little bit more of that, like that drive that you get from it. Um, so those are going to be the differences between a natural athlete and someone who's not natural, who's coming off now. So how do you help women with that? What Cause that's well, gotta be a what, lot for them. Well, what you're seeing, like when you see women who do a show and then they blow up after, Usually what has happened when that happens is a, they probably were using something like Nolvidex, um, you know, during their prep. And Which is then the estrogen, anti-estrogen. The estrogen, estrogen blocker. blocker. Okay. Uh, so it's the CIRM. So the, the Nolvidex, again, like that's, that's by, that's being like bound to all those estrogen receptors, right? But you still have all this estrogen that's floating around in your body. So if you all of a sudden pull that Nolvidex and you stop taking it cold turkey, guess what's going to happen? Now you don't have the Nolvidex that's bound to all those receptors, all that estrogen that's floating around. Now it's, now it can bind to all those receptors, right? And yeah. now that's when you see women get, because what happens when you get your period and your estrogen is high? You get fucking bloated, right? Bloated, yeah. You look like a, you look like a, like, Bloat. right? So <laughs> I know for myself, I gained like freaking 10 pounds on to get my period, right? It's ridiculous. But, you know, so again, same thing. And then, so what happens to compound that is they stop taking the Nolvidex cold turkey, right? And then they eat like an asshole after the show. And then they don't do their cardio or they're not working out. Um, and then that's like the uh, this perfect storm for like blowing up right after a show. I've seen it so many times with women. Um, so if people you're gonna that aren't on anything and people that aren't on anything and yeah. they just blow up because you said eating like an asshole, which we'll talk about in a second. Right. But I mean, I've seen people backstage with suitcases. No joke with the roll, you know, the rolling ones where you're they're rolling around. And then in the suitcase, they've got like, I don't even know. The whole thing is packed with junk food, tons of junk yeah. food. And they're all excited about eating the junk food. Oh, and drinking and got to have yeah. the wine and everything else above it. So that's just people that are are just coming off of a show without the PED. So what you're saying is now you're adding in pulling out something like Novadex. And it's like, uh, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. This is scary, Jamie. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's uh you know, so the PCT becomes an important part of like keeping your hormone and, and your just your body healthy as you're using anabolics because 
you know, you can use these compounds and not completely destroy yourself, but you have to be smart. You have to be doing your PCT. Um, and, and what I'm doing right now is I'm actually, so I'm doing a series, like a video series on PCT where I'm going to cover, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking it up into sections where I'm covering a liver health, then I'm going to do like liver and kidney health. Then we're going to talk about hormone health, how to correct all of those things. Um, and I'm going to be sharing that on my Instagram and on my YouTube. And then once those videos get released, there's going to be free PDF downloads that'll have clickable links for all the products that I use in my, like all of my clients, um, PCT. So I think you have a like, freebie now too, right? You have something out uh, there so right that, now for people? Uh, so right now, I think the only download I have is the um, like Amino Asylum uh, protocols. Um, so I know that you can go on my link tree and there's like a download for that. And that's really, so the Amino Asylum protocols, that's all like the peptides um, and like the injectable fat burners, things like that, and how how I use them. Um, so if you're a woman who, you know, maybe you want a little bit of an edge, but you don't want to mess with your hormones, like you don't want to mess with the anabolics, you don't want to worry about virilization, but maybe you want to like put on a little bit of size, or maybe you want to like, you know, accelerate some fat loss, going to that PDF download will give you, you know, peptides that like, I don't have any SARMs on there, but like, cause I don't really do the SARMs things, but um, you know, I've got a whole peptide protocols and even like the injectable fat burners like l carnitine and stuff like that. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out, but all the PCT downloads, um, those are when all going to be come coming out? in the next. So that's all like I'm working on all of, like uh, creating all that video content this week. So hopefully by the end of the week, um, I actually just started up my YouTube channel too. So I'm going to be doing it both on Instagram and on YouTube. Um, so that, you know, people can follow it on all different platforms. And um, so it's easily accessible. The YouTube's going to be nice because then there'll be playlists with different topics and stuff. So um, that's some exciting new stuff coming out. But yeah. when I release the video on the, like each PCT topic, I'll give, I'll, you know, get the link on there for the downloads as well. And I think that's great because I think at the end of the day, uh, people are going to be introduced to and a lot of different compounds, I think. And it's important for people to be educated to know that they need to research things. But also the idea of post psychotherapy, I don't know if that's even something that's common practice or is it? I think it's becoming uh, more common, but it's still, uh, I still think that it, there needs to be more knowledge around it, especially for women. I think for men, they've got that, like, they've got that down. Um, but for women, it's still fairly new. Like I said, when I started bodybuilding, no one, I didn't even, I didn't even know what PCT was. Um, How'd you even get into bodybuilding? Who I got you? into bodybuilding. <laughs> so I, before I started bodybuilding, I was in construction. Um, and I would, you know, I smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. I was an alcoholic. And, uh, one day I just like looked in the mirror and I was like 25 at the time. And I was just like, I looked like I was 35. I felt like crap. And I was like, this is not the life I want to live. Mm -hmm. And I decided to quit drinking and quit smoking. And I had a lot of free time after that. Because all I did was like go to the bar all the time and drink. Uh, so I was like, what am I going to do with all this free time? I was really unhappy with my body. So I was like, I'm going to go to the gym and just see what I can do. I'd always really admired female athletes and I had never been an athlete in my life. I failed gym class. Um, mm. I just, I, yeah, like I, I You'd never no know. Aim. You look so athletic, <laughs> right? Like I was yeah. never an athlete. Never. Um, mm. people would always say, Oh, you're never gonna be an athlete, Jane. You're too clumsy. Um, so Who I never tried. Who I never tried. That? Right. Oh my God, People. So, uh, so then I started going to the gym. I met a girl who competed we started training together. I went to her first show, helped her backstage. It was Team U. And this was the first year they had bikini in Team U. Oh, and okay. uh, she ended up getting her pro card. And uh, so I saw, but I saw the figure girls. This is before they had women's physique. I saw the figure girls and I was like, I'm going to do that. I'm like, I'm going to do that. And that's, that's when I decided I was going to bodybuild. And I started in bikini. I did terrible Hold on. In bikini. Stop. Stop right yep. there. Say that again. What? I, yeah, I did bikini <laughs> for two years. I no got way. dead last. At, 
I got dead Aww, last at like why? all my bikini shows. Why? Um, well, the first one, like I said, my first show, like I was natural. I was not nearly lean enough. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I look at the picture, like I have a video somewhere of me on stage. And I did, uh, my first show was the New England's in, in Boston, which is like a huge show. Yeah, like, right. You don't do New England's <laughs> as your first show, uh, oh my God. especially when you have no idea how it's I was going to say, how, did you what? know? <laughs> did I you had know no it was idea. big? No, no idea. Okay. No idea. <laughs> So, I, you know, I ended up going to New England. I bombed. I got, like, dead last. But I have a video somewhere of me posing. And it's, like, a giraffe on ice skates, right? Oh, no. It's awful. So, and, and then my other bikini shows, I ended up getting, like, dead last in those. And those, those the shows with the year after, um, I was too lean for, for bikini. And so I really should have just jumped into figure uh, in those shows. But you live this and you learn. What year? And then... So yeah, so that was my second year competing in bikini, and then well, whereabouts? Where so is that two thousand and early two thousand ten? So that 12, was somewhere. My first year competing was two thousand and eight. So, okay, so my figure second looked year, a lot different then. Uh, yes, yeah, and so then, like after my second year of competing in bikini, I didn't like. I hated the bikini division. I didn't want to be in it. Um, I didn't even want to do bikini that year. I wanted to do figure that year, and I should have. Um, so I decided, like, I'm like you know what? Like I should have done figure. I would have placed better. I would have done a lot better. I'm like, I'm sick of listening to what everyone, cause I had a coach that was like, you have to start in bikini. You have to do well in bikini, and then you can move up to figure. And you know, I ditched that coach and I was like, fuck that. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. Mm. Um, and I decided that, you know, I'm like, screw it. Uh, I, so that was the year that women's physique came out. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm yeah, not going to compete again until I do that division. So nice. I skipped figure, went right to women's physique, and I like fell in love with it. And I'll tell you what, if you're a competitor and a new competitor, and you're like, you know, trying to like, you look at your body and you're like, oh, there's no way I can be in women's physique. Um, you know, I've got to stay in bikini or I've got to stay in figure because of you know the way that my my body is or I don't have enough muscle yet well guess what like you can change and you like go with the division where your heart is on fire because when you are like say like with myself I didn't like bikini you know how much effort I put into my bikini shows like 70 percent right because I wasn't excited about it like I hated bikini right but when women's physique I was excited about it you know how much effort I put into those preps into getting to the women's physique stage? 110%. So you're going to work 10 times harder at something you really fucking want opposed to working half ass for something that eh, I'm not really excited about. I and couldn't agree more because this is a sport that is a sport of longevity, or at least it can be. So mm -hmm. again, you can do this at 20, 50, six teenagers, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even 50s and 60s. I mean, you can, this is timeless. And so what you're saying is, I mean, maybe right now, I mean, if this is the division that you want, try it, do your best, max it out. And then at each year you should be getting better unless you're the person who's cardio queen and on 800 right. calories, then that's never going to happen. But again, I think that if you look at it from a longevity standpoint, and I like that you said that you should not just be told what to do, do what you want to do. This is for most yes. people, it is a hobby. Okay. It is mm -hmm. something that they may or may not ever really do more beyond. If you want to be a coach, you want to aspire to do other things. Yes. Competing can help, you know, build your portfolio. So that from that standpoint, it's not, but um, competing itself can be something that you can do for a really, really long time. So you know, I, I like that you said that compete where you want to compete and don't necessarily listen mm -hmm. to what everyone is telling you. So you're telling me that you had all these voices in your ear that were telling you to do this, this, that, and the other thing. And you finally said, Nope, I'm going to do, yeah. I'm going to do physique. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know, what, fuck, I'm just gonna do what I want to do. And it was the best decision I made, you know, and for because, me, next you know, year I had a lot of people telling me, you know, I, I would tell people that I was going to be an Olympian and they would laugh at me. You know, like, okay, Jamie, yeah, right, okay. Really? And they so now it's great because my <laughs> Olympia picture Three times. is like huge poster size at their gym. 
Is and it just really? like looking at them the entire time they train. I'm like, huh. <laughs> which, uh, by the way, your yeah. original gym is my gym. Energy Fitness. A little shout out to Dina, Brett, and Luke, and and no, Rob. my home gym is the Montanary Powerhouse Gym. So that's well, where my ex husband was originally. Oh, from. originally, but didn't you go? Yeah, to Yeah, my ex husband. I I went. I visited there maybe one or two times. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, he right, worked so, there. I oh, yeah, he'd I, worked there. Got it. Yeah, I only visited a couple times. Yeah, yeah. No, I I come from the uh, Montanary Powerhouse Gym. It's still, I mean, I I still do very much like love that gym. I miss it every day. Um, but yeah, that was that was my old my, my old stomping ground there, and it's fun. It's always fun to go back because I feel like a little celebrity when I go back there. It's fun. Well, you are. You're you're a three time yeah. Olympian. <laughs> Hello, and you're, you're. I love that you are able to you know tell the naysayers that you made it to the Olympia three times. And and I'm telling the naysayers, look, I'm in my 40s, and I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try competing again, and you know, I'm not gonna let anybody tell me I can. I'm gonna do the best I can and bring the best package that I possibly can because this is an individual sport. At the end of the day, it's yeah. about our own individual goals. And, you know, Jamie, you bring a lot of knowledge about a topic that is is swept under the rug. It is considered taboo. I think it's a lot of misinformation out there. And I think, you know, you have being a voice for this is so important. Um, you know, one last question I have for you. Sure. So you mentioned eating like an asshole, which I just love that terminology. I'm going to recycle that. Yep. <laughs> what does eating like an asshole look like for Jamie Pinder? For me now or when I competed? <laughs> Both. <laughs> you mean there's All right. Levels? So when I <laughs> when I competed, you know, when I first started competing, so there's you know, there's kind of like different like, you know, phases and when I compete. So when I first started competing, um, like, you know, if I was gonna eat like an asshole, I actually like I would eat like an entire pizza. I would eat an entire gallon of ice cream, like a whole package of like I was one of those people that like I could eat just for hours and just like eat everything. Right. <laughs> you were the girl um, with the suitcase my, I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it was crazy because there were a couple of years when I competed and it was like, every time I would have a cheat meal like that. And like, granted, I was only eating like that when I was super shredded. So one thing is like, when you get super shredded, you can have a cheat meal. That's like, just like you can just gorge for hours and you're going to wake up the next day and you're going to look 10 times better. You're going to look freaky when you wake up, like veins everywhere. You're going to be popping like crazy. So, but you like, you have to get to a certain level of conditioning. You can't do that when you're still fat, because guess what? You're only going to get fatter. Um, but if you're like in this sweet spot at the end of prep, then you can eat like an asshole like that for like one day and you'll look better the next day. That's why a lot of people, the day after the show, they end up looking better. So same, kind of like same principle. So back when I first started competing, that's what it looked like. And then when I was with Matt Jansen, I didn't have a cheat meal for like over a year. Um, I was 100% clean, organic, everything. I had Lyme disease at the time. So there was like some health wow. things underlying that I did that mm. for. Um, and then back then, like a cheat meal, like me going all out was me having like sushi and maybe like a cookie and that was like me going all out and then know, now that, i don't <laughs> right well well that's you know that's the difference and like you yeah. also like you can also see the difference in the way that my physique looked at those times though when i would have those big like garbage food uh like binges my body didn't look nearly as good as when i was with matt and my cheat meals were clean sushi and maybe a cookie um you know so i looked a hell of a lot better. I felt a hell of a lot better um, with the latter situation. Um, and then like you now, had a healthier relationship with food. Yeah. I mean, eh, I'm not no. sure if it was healthier. It was, no. I was actually so, I was so obsessed with everything being like organic and perfect and clean that even like having sushi, like almost like made me anxious. So it was, a, it was too much. Oh, wow. Um, like I needed to like back off from that a little bit. And I'm like, I would, I remember I went on vacation with my husband at the time we went to Miami and I was like a freaking Nazi with my food the entire time. And it's things like that, that I look back on and I'm like, fuck, I should have just like, like let loose a little, like mm. not been such a pain in the ass about my freaking food and everything else, <laughs> but you live and you learn, right? Like I've yeah. got to grow from that situation. Where um, are you now? So I, I have. 
So now if I'm going to like go all out, uh, you know, I might have like a burger and then like a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's or like, you know, so, something like that. Nothing too crazy. Um, I don't like, like, I don't like food that makes me feel like crap. Um, so it's like more like, you know, going out to a nice steakhouse, maybe like getting a really nice dinner and then coming back and having a good dessert after I'm more of a sweets person. Um, I could really do without dinner at all and just go right to dessert and I'd be, I'd be happy. How often do you have an off plan meal? Right now I don't. Um, because I'm, I'm dieting right now for, I'm going on vacation. Um, Ooh, where are you going? So, so I'm going to Dominican with my mother. Uh, we're leaving on Thanksgiving and I'm not going to, I'm not answering the phone. No text. No, don't be a pain. No, Jamie, you're not allowed to be a pain. (laughs) I am off the grid for five days. Good. So, uh, I'm going with my mother. Uh, it was lugging your gallon of water around. No, I, you know, it was her 60th birthday this year. So this is like her birthday present of us, like having this girl's trip. So I'm like, I just want to be in awesome shape for, uh, you know, for, for this little vacation. I'll probably do some photo shoots when I get back. Um, so right now I'm not having any, but usually like when I'm not like dieting for something specific, I'll have, you know, I'll eat some, if I want to have a free meal, I'll have one. I don't really restrict myself. Um, but honestly, like I'm, a like, I don't go out that much. I don't go out to eat much. Um, I prefer to just like stay on my diet. That's just how I like to feel is well, I just like feeling good. Well, you look amazing. So Thank it's you. worth it. Yeah, it's it's worth it. And uh, one last question. One B. I said one last, but I lied. So one more. What's your favorite body okay. part to train? <laughs> I'd have to say quads. quads. Quads are my favorite. What exercise? Yeah, I love quads. Ooh, um, probably, uh, like mm, single leg, like squats or split squats or, you know, lunges. I like the single leg stuff. Yeah. Those burn. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) Jamie, you are amazing. Boy, the things that you shared today, I can't thank you enough. Um, I want everybody that's listening to go find Jamie on Instagram. And you also said you have a new YouTube channel as well. Is it you call Jamie Pinder? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so your you Instagram profile. Me, yeah. Go ahead and share where Jamie they can find Pinder, you. Jamie Pinder 14 is my Instagram. And yeah, on, on YouTube, I just started it. So there's only one video up right now. Um, but I'll be uploading that content. Uh, you know, I'm planning on putting out a couple of videos a week on the YouTube channel. So, uh, you know, starting with some like, you know, frequently asked questions, I'm going to do a whole highlight on just like Anavar uh, the first week. So You'll get some really good content even in the, the first week of me putting stuff up there. That's excellent. I think the information that you're sharing is incredible. I don't think there's enough of it being shared. I don't think a lot of the information that is out there is speaking in layman's terms. If I was to offer that layman's terms, if I was to offer that to you, because I don't think people really know, you know, you speak so freely about these these compounds and then you go into the different com- different types of compounds and people don't know what you're talking about. Um, right. You know, I know from hearsay, but I don't, you also can can speak from experience too and you in in an absolute wealth of knowledge so I I highly encourage everyone to go check you out Jamie Pinder 14 and then also on the YouTube channel Jamie I hope you come back on I'm sure there we talked about a lot today can you believe it yeah we did wow I know when I saw your questions I was like ooh. I was like, we're going to go over a lot today. We've been yeah. buckle up. But yes, this has been great. You're I, a busy I appreciate lady. you having me on. Oh my Thank goodness. you so much. Be sure to download your free guide, Five Things Every Bodybuilder and Fitness Competitor Needs to Know Before Your Next Show at eeinbb.com. That's www.eeinbb.com. 